Okay, folks, today we're moving on to sort of uh, governance frameworks. <coughs> I want to sort of take us a fairly quick gallop through this lot. Whether we get through the 33 slides or not, probably not. Uh, we'll probably get bored before we get there. Um, but I want to look at the sort of ways that we can understand what we should be doing. Now, this is a relatively old presentation. All you need to do is to change BS 7799 to ISO 27002, and that'll kind of keep you together with uh, where today's versions are. And one of, there's another framework that is used called ITIL, which you may have come across as well. I want to do a little bit of comparison between ITIL and 27001, 27002 and the risk one, which is the old 7799 part three. So you'll be needing a copy, and I suggest this year you go just the 27002-2013 version. Um, also find the ITIL uh, guidelines, because you won't be able to get a hold of the full ITIL uh, sort of structure, but you get a fairly good um, perspective on it. And the Office of uh, Government Commerce as well is a good one, the OGC. They're quite useful. They tell you how the government today, the UK government, looks at managing big projects and trying to get them done successfully. Because we're not very good at that at the moment. We haven't been for many, many years. And there's also a publication called COBIT. ITIL and ISO 177999 for business benefit, and that's a quite a useful uh, comparison of the three processes, or three ways of looking at information security and information governance. And you've got the IT Governance Institute, the Office of Government Commerce, and the IT Service Management Forum, ITSMF, who kind of operate in the UK and provide some interesting insights and understanding about how we should be going about the whole of IT governance, the project side, the security side, and all the other things which are really critical to getting IT used effectively and information used effectively. <coughs> A few little historical bits that will help you, which we'll just sort of knit through. The ob objectives. IT is all about IT service management. Um, it's supposed to provide pretty good best practice uh, guidance for delivering IT services. So go back to two years ago, IT service management, IT all kind of looks after that. ISO 27002 used to be 7799 or 17799. Provide a framework <coughs> of, a, of a standard for information security management. That's the internationally agreed terminology, although the British Standards Organization very much would prefer to have seen it called the standard for information governance. Because if you look at the different chapters in it, it is actually much more than about just the information security management is a lot, lot more. We'll have a quick look at what best practices are about, can we achieve them, and why do we need them. Part of the answer is here, but I want you also to go and actually do some research into the question after we've finished this sort of session. <coughs> is critical, it's absolutely vital. If you look at all the problems that we have with IT over the long, well, ever since the time began virtually with IT, um, there are problems if the IT doesn't work, if we don't manage it effectively. Management frameworks are needed so we know what to do, both internally and externally. How to actually interact with the world in terms of information sharing, 
so that we don't give away each other's secrets inadvertently or deliberately. If we are lucky and work very hard at it, good practices and best practices actually have some benefits, may help us to become more efficient. Sometimes we don't need quite so much reliance on uh, experts. Sometimes we get fewer errors. And sometimes we get better trust between business partners. And you can see this aspect very, very much in the field of financial services and the relationship with the regulators. Uh, there are many, many big banks out there who <coughs> have almost no respect from the regulators because they keep coming back and doing the same things wrong time and time again. And eventually they run foul of the regulators and end up with some very, very large fines. One of the important things about good and best practices and these management practices for uh, information governance is that we need to have governance processes which are consistent with the risk management and control framework for each organization. And we need to bear that in mind as we move through the, the, this sort of activity today, uh, particularly when we look at COVID. Because if we look at 27002, we can see how that can be easily scaled in relation to that and is appropriate for the organization. Whereas some of the other frameworks which are out there are pretty monolithic and there is very little opportunity to scale the process to take account of these sorts of factors. Oops. Now, one of the most critical things that has to be um, undertaken is to make sure that those processes are actually, actually actively used all the time. They don't become shelfware. If I go back to the mid-90s, there was an ISO standard called ISO 9000, which is about how you set out your processes and procedures and then prove through a annual, biannual, triannual uh, audit that you know, you know where these procedures are and that you're doing them. And one of the problems across almost all industries in the 90s, in 9000, was that people worked very hard to get the <coughs> working practices of procedures and so on into the manual for the department. And then as soon as it was finished, it was then put up on the highest shelf out of the way where it would stay untouched, unread, gathering dust for the next three years or however long the cycle was. <clears throat> and then when they got a notification that uh, the audit was happening, it would be quickly found, dusted off, and then a small team would feverishly go through all the working practice documents and procedures and process documents and workflow documents and bring them up to date to what we currently do. Because the audit, by the whoever does the audit for ISO 9000, would come in and say, well, what are your latest procedures? Now demonstrate that you do what your procedure says. And if you, do, if you show that you do what it says, that's great. Tick, 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 tick. If you haven't got all the procedures up to date and you can't prove that that's how you do the job, well, you get lots of X's in your boxes and you kind of fail your audit. And that means that you probably lose some of your contracts because some of your contracts are going to be with organizations that require you to have a current ISO 9000 certification. And most organizations with these lots and lots of procedures and processes just park it up there. And then they do the job as they best they can to actually meet the needs of their various customers. Because the problem with these processes and procedures is they tend to be Pareto principle. So they cover the 20% of the tasks which do 90% of the activity. And then those other 90% of the tasks, 20% <coughs> of the activity, kind of no longer exist. It just doesn't happen. Which is one of my problems I have with the, the concept of process-bound organization. 
brings you down to the lowest common denominator, it allows almost no initiative, it allows no professionalism, you just tick, tick, tick. And you can see, if you, if you watch, if, if you've got a long enough memory, you can see how that's happened a lot in parts of medicine and in general practice. You have to go with this, 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 and this. Uh, and partly it's because the result of one or two rogue doctors over the years who have actually caused absolute havoc with their patients, killed them off in one way or another. And so it kind of brings up at the worst person, people up to the, a lower and acceptable standard. But it kind of brings the best down rather than allowing the best to actually fly and really deliver fabulous service. So good practices need to really get into the heads of people. It has to be in the head and the heart rather than up on the shelf. And it has to be in the heart, not the head, because you can know what to do, but you may not still believe it or feel for it, and then you don't do it. And that's what happened in IBM in the <coughs> 1990s, while uh, Lou Gerstner was head of IBM, and he was trying to change the culture from multiple organizations, sub, sub organizations that dealt with mainframes, AS400s, disk storage PCs, operating systems, databases, and so on where the customer had to work out where to go to get all the satisfaction. And he said, no, this is crazy. Each customer needs a single point of contact, and that person has to understand the internal structure. And by the end of that, his period there, about nine, ten years, it was very interesting, the, a report by, a case study by Jeffrey Walsham, shows that only in North, IBM North America really had taken it to it heart and soul as well as mind. The rest of the world could pass the test, what was it supposed to be, but they didn't actually believe in it. And it's only when you believe in it that you actually start doing it properly. And so, what to do, how to do it, why it's important, and from there, and then to believing in it and actually doing it is the greatest problem. Paul Strasman, uh, who wrote, writes a lot about um, IT, effectiveness of IT, the IT productivity gap, um, getting better returns from IT investment. Also, Nicholas Carr, he writes, written some very, very interesting articles on that. Again, there's a problem in IT that, and year by year, we're spending more and more on IT and still seem to get very little return on our investment. And you know, <clears throat> we know that we're spending something like three or four percent of world GDP on information, technology, computing, communication stuff. It's around about three trillion dollars a year, and the world GDP is about sixty-three trillion dollars. So it's nearly five percent of that. And yet we don't have successful systems by and large. Yes, we need it to be able to operate as quickly as we do, but there are an awful lot of costs associated with the failures and so on. And I mean, depending on how you calculate the actual costs of all the of IT's failures, it's somewhere between half a trillion and six trillion. So on the worst assumption, taking account of all of the costs to rectify failure and work around failure, you know, the organizational costs of working around the failure and foregone benefits, uh, lost opportunities, the six trillion, that means IT is actually wasting twice what we spend on it, which is kind of an interesting concept. It's more value destructive than the financial services world by and large, because computing is doing it all the time, whereas financial services only blow up once every 10 years or so. Governance is also terribly important in a whole range of areas um, in international finance, in Basel II, Basel III, lots of things are coming along. But also incredibly important in finance, pharmaceuticals, healthcare, aerospace, all sorts of regulatory requirements. Well, we all know about problems with network security, security in general, uh, cybercrime, cyber fraud growing, huge range of issues in terms of privacy. And interestingly, although that's an objective, 
if we actually look at the levels of vulnerabilities, one of the Vs of big data, we don't seem to be getting to grips with it effectively. Whether it's at security level, whether it's at the integrity level of the systems and the data, whether it's at reputational risk. <clears throat> and you remember the company Target? Did you see what happened them, to them this week? You know, remember they, were, they had that huge loss of um, uh, identity theft episode about a year and a half ago, and they had a bit of a reputational problem over using analytics the year before that. Well, in the last few month or two, they've had some problems where some hackers have found a way to get into the Tannoy systems, the public address systems in different shops, and then play pornography over it. And what was really exciting, there was no way that once it had been connected up, that the people in the, in the shop could actually switch it off. They couldn't pull the plug, because there was no plug to pull. All you had to do was to dial in and ask to be connected to a particular extension number, which took you straight through to the PA system, and until you actually closed off your phone line, no one else could cut you off. Now, I mean, that presumably could happen in almost any organisation that has PA systems in the shops, where you just phone into it or get connected. In. Obviously, having had it happen, they have worked out what was happening. They've now banned all connections from outside into that, number, that uh, particular uh, extension number. One of the things we've also seen over the last ooh, 20, 25 years now, really, is to move away from custom software to standardized software, which is why ERP systems look like. PeopleSoft or Oracle uh, and others in SAP are coming in to try so that huge investment is made once by a, an expert company like SAP, like Oracle, like IBM with um, WebSphere. And then organizations have to realize, by and large, there's very little that's unique in their processes. What they do with the information, what they do with the processes, that actually is the innovative bit. And whereas, as Nick Carr points out quite a few times, is that IT per se is utility, is complete utility. There is nothing really distinguishing about most forms of software these days. It's how you use it that really is the important thing. <clears throat> and hence this drive towards very standardized software, very standardized process and procedures. And that's what's driving business a lot. And then there's lots of standards, lots of frameworks that help us to do everything we want. But the trouble is, most of these are not very scalable. You have the thing, and you do it, or you don't do it. We'll skip through ITIL. If I can speed up a little bit further. It's about service management. Um, there's a whole set of best practices that the government, UK government have found kind of is helpful. One of the interesting points to me about ITIL being created by the government is that they are some of the most catastrophically incompetent providers of IT systems there are. If you look at the National Audit Office reports over the many, many years, the last 20 years, there are remarkably few examples of large government contracts in IT that have been remotely successful. And whether you look at child benefit system, whether you look at um, the LIBRA system, whether you look at the things like the uh, LASCAD, the London Ambulance System, which is kind of government related. And you go through almost 25 years of National Audit Office reports, you will find very, very, very few success stories. So obviously most of this doesn't actually work as good practice. It would appear. And it again comes back to part of my scepticism for lots of these frameworks. They're kind of interesting, 
that are actually potentially quite good if you can get everybody involved, senior manager, middle manager, junior manager, supervisor, and all of the people active at the lower level to do all of these things. They're not great guidelines. But the question you have to ask yourself is, why doesn't it work? <coughs> what's with it, what is it with us human beings that ultimately fails to actually get this thing to working? And it kind of struck me as interesting, although this is all about IT, and the Standish Group reports are all about IT-related projects, over the last month or two, there have been occasional reports in the press about the network rail company. The fact that they've got 38 odd billion quids worth of upgrade, rail upgrade uh, programs, electrification of the Midlands line and the uh, West of England line out towards uh, to Wales and so on. And they are not, turn out not to be terribly good at meeting their uh, timetable and the budgets. <coughs> Which is also similar in many other big, big type, big industries. That most big projects, all of the stuff goes out the window. They're always late, always over budget, and then suddenly, out of the woodwork, comes another lovely little project uh, for the next few months, perhaps or next year or two. Is Big Ben needs about forty million quid spending on itself on the clock and the Elizabeth Tower to because it's kind of falling apart. And obviously someone's done a fairly good job of estimating the time scale, the resources required, and it's going to cost about 40 million. However, in the report in the Times on Saturday was a little item that said, oh, and by the way, the, the business managers in the Houses of Parliament are going to challenge the cost estimate and try, find, try and find ways of reducing that 40 million to something smaller. My bet, yeah, they'll do that. They'll set it out, they'll reduce the time scale, reduce the cost uh, in the budget, and it'll come in at around about 40 million plus or minus a couple of million at the end of the day. It will be over the official budget, which will be, I don't know, 30, 35 million probably, but it will actually come in on around about the current estimate of 40 odd million, and it'll take whatever time it takes in the current estimates. And it's interesting that all of these things happen. People with the money, who hold the money, will try to reduce the official budget, and then the real budget comes back. And I remember a lovely project um, I was in, peripherally involved with many years ago, and the original estimate I think was something around 90 million, I think it was, or 100 million, and <clears throat> certain amount of resources and so on. Uh, the company involved decided at the senior level that it should be reduced by around about 10 to 15 million pounds in project cost. In the end, it came out with a gnat's whisker of the original 90 million estimate. It was a perfect estimate. The, budget, the, over, the official overspend of 10 million was purely because of senior management or sponsor um, optimism. And you can see this around the world in almost every project. The experts doing the planning probably get it about right a lot of the time. It's then whittled down by the, the senior management, the sponsor, the directors and so on to what they politically want to spend. And then they get all tetchy when it comes in back at the original estimate. Or if it comes in at um, the budgeted spend, it doesn't do what it's supposed to do. And it's kind of interesting to see that over the many, many, many years. This just takes you through some of what ITIL can do. One of the things about ITIL is to try and look at things in the broad. And instead, instead of getting down into the ditches, you know, those sort of tiny bits, dealing with the petals on the daisies and so on, it's trying to get back out to see the shape of the ditch overall to see the shape of the forest rather than the trees in it. The holistic in everything together. Um, one of the problems in IT often has been separating out the functional requirements and the non-functional, the functional are the things that it does 
the non-functionals are typically communication, security, uh, and availability type of issues. And if we don't get that right, it all falls apart. Testing, if we don't do the right sort of testing, again, we can get some very, very nasty um, surprises. I had a lovely one once where we'd done some testing on a very tiny environment, and it worked a treat. After go live, rather than having a table of a few thousand rows, you had a table with a, about 50 million rows in it. Suddenly, when they started doing queries on that table, the, the system effectively went, well, it just sort of collapsed for half an hour and then came back to life. And it turned out that what had happened is in, in the configuration of this system, on a particular transaction, they changed the search index from one column to another column and had forgotten to put an index on that column. So the poor little machine was now searching up and down 50 million rows, which took it half an hour every time someone ran that particular transaction. And of course you wouldn't see that in the test environment, because on a few thousand, you put the whole of a thousand row table, or five thousand row table into core, and it goes zoom, it doesn't really matter. But you've got 50 million of them, you aren't gonna get all 50 million rows in, in core. And even then, searching 50 million rows is going to be a bit slow. But if it's coming off the hard drive, like that, it takes you half an hour. And we didn't see that. So there's some interesting questions about testing. See lots of problems with that. Well, I guess that actually, if we look at what's happened over the last 30, 40 years, we do take account often of the customer more than we used to, particularly so much of our um, IT is actually out to the general public now. And they access them on all sorts of devices, whether it's smart devices or websites and so on. But it also refers to inside, the user customers inside your company. And sometimes you're not very good at doing that. ITIL has two sides to it. One is service support and the other is service delivery. And the thing about ITIL ultimately is that you need to do both. <coughs> Get it out there and then keep it supported. And it raises lots of interesting and valuable questions to you as you operate, implementing operating systems. 27,002. This term is the one that I prefer more than any of the other frameworks because it's very, very explicitly orientated around asking you to ask sensible questions about what you're doing in your organization with information and developing your systems, thinking about the people involved in the systems and so on. And it's, <coughs> it's so much easier in some respects to use. <coughs> and when it first started our BS British Standard 7799, it was very much related to legal requirements for security and to generally accepted good and best practices around, certainly around the UK with the 20, 25 companies who were actively involved in, in creating it in its simple form in the very early days in the mid to late 90s. <coughs> and these are three particularly critical legal requirements which um, apply certainly within the UK and pretty much all around the world. Protection, non-disclosure of personal data, very much built into the European and the British data protection regime. <coughs> Less so in some other countries, except in particular industries. And the USA has very, very tight controls on non-disclosure protection of personal data in the medical field, but much less so in many other areas legal requirement to protect your internal information and intellectual property rights, patents and other private information. 
And you can see the same sort of ideas here as we saw in ITIL in the previous set. It also talks about the fact that you need some critical success factors to make something like this work. And again, these are rather nice in um, ISO 20,000 series. It actually talks to you about some of the important things that an organization needs to get in place if it's going to make or be successful in, um, in uh, developing and using and operating a good information governance environment. All sorts of things here. Lots of good advice. Um, this is the broad structure of the sections in the ISO 27002. <coughs> Certainly 27, the 2005 version, the 2013 kind of moved them around a little bit, but they still pretty much reflect this. <coughs> and as you can see, it covers every part of what you need to do. And then, of course, as, as is always is a good idea, is don't use just one simple source. Go for multiple perspectives and create a synthesis, create an integration, integrate things. And so what we can do, if we really want to be successful, is to say, okay, 27002 helps us to understand what we need to do. ITIL tells us how to do it. And you pull it together. Whereas many organizations are, oh, we'll do ITIL. <clears throat> and others say, oh, we'll do 27,002. And others say, oh, we'll do COVID. And it's really rather more important to find the good bits in each framework. The good questions here and the good questions there that you can bring together and create something that's unique to you that actually works. <coughs> and so that book about COVID, ITIL, and 27,000 really is what gives you some of the guidance on how you can pull them together and obtain great value. It may or may not be at this uh, link, but the isica.org will help you to find that um, aligning those three processes. I'm not going to talk about COVID itself. A, I don't particularly like it. I think it's much too heavyweight. Uh, it's very much based around American needs, American organizations, and most British companies don't need to worry about COVID. Um, other countries who are trading heavily with America or the USA may need to work with COVID instead of some other processing, just because of contractual requirements. <coughs> so that's kind of that's a, what I want to cover in terms of the, the basic sort of structure, the basic approach.